you've got a Bible, turn with me to Judges chapter 2. <clears throat> I said in the first service, I feel like we're about knee deep in Judges, just kind of starting to wade in. Uh, and doing it slowly, and that's by design, because for for me, I'll just speak for me, and maybe this applies to some of you, uh, my typical experience with judges is to grab a hold of three or four key stories of actual judges, Gideon and maybe Deborah, and I always like Ehud and the stabbing the guy through the fat, that part, you know, just kind of always stuck with me. It's hard not to love that story when you're like 10. Uh, Samson, of course, he's kind of right up there in the better known stories and judges, but we tend to just sort of know the stories, but not know the context. So we don't know why we have the stories, right? And each story, of course, has incredible value to it, and there are things that we can pull out of it, things that should apply to our lives. We're going to do that as we work through this great book over the next number of weeks, but, but there's also a bigger purpose. God has put all these stories together kind of collected them into this book, put them in the order he's put them in, included the details he's included for one giant comprehensive purpose. And we don't understand that until we start reading through the book, working through the book, particularly in the introduction, because the introduction is for people like me who are simple and need it spelled out. It's like, here's what you're supposed to learn, Don. We're not going to just depend on you kind of intuitively figuring this out through the course of the book. We're going to spell it out in the first two chapters that as you start working through the book, you're not going to miss it, which, you know, I probably have a tendency to do that. And so the introduction is really important, even though it's probably not the part that's familiar to us. It's not actually the stories of the judges yet. We're actually, next week, that's when we finally arrive at our very first judge and we start actually getting into one of those stories. But over these last few weeks, we've been laying the framework and we're going to finish that off this morning. Um, hopefully then better prepared to understand understand why are these stories even here what's God teaching us and how do we how do we live how do we know who he is and who we are and and answer some of those big important questions of life uh, so we've went through chapter one uh, that took us kind of a couple weeks we saw Israel come into the land we saw them half obeying half disobeying kind of what God had asked them to do they largely fail to do what God asked them to do by chapter two we see God clearly saying here's my assessment of the situation the first few verses you have disobeyed as a result of this there is going to be consequence we don't disobey God without a price to pay and that's not because God's vindictive, it's because he's made us and he understands life. He understands how it ought to be lived and he, he's given us his word to guide us and direct us. And when we choose to ignore it and go our own way, it doesn't make for a happier life, ultimately. And it's worth just remembering that together. We went then last week through the... Uh, through this strange little scene that comes by chapter 2, verse 6, where one generation who had seen the mighty works of the Lord, and it's incredible, right, what this generation got to see, they marched into battle with virtually no sense of what they were doing. I don't know whether they even had weapons half the time. Simply the confidence that God was going to show up. And he did. And that whole generation saw the Lord work in some profound ways. They trusted the Lord. That was the generation of which Joshua was a part who would just make these incredible proclamations. You know, as for, I'm not sure about the rest of you, but as for me and my family, we're just like unreservedly, we're going to follow and serve the Lord because we've just seen him too clearly in all his might and glory. We can't not. And then within one generation, the whole thing falls apart. And we walked through that a little bit last week of how one generation, one generation removed from that, who just heard of but didn't see, didn't truly know, didn't comprehend, didn't understand how great a God they were serving. With one generation, it is all gone. A couple quick things before we get into new territory here this morning that I want to just kind of remind you of from last week, point out that I didn't have enough time last week. Notice in Scripture, it's here in chapter 2, it's elsewhere, that, that our, our actions always precede our, our, our thinking. We tend to think it's the other way around. Um, let me explain that a little bit more. So we, we sort of, we tend to act our way from God, not think our way away from God. 
I'll give you an example that's really easy to pick on. If you send an 18-year-old away to university, and then they come back at reading week or Christmas, and they say, you know what, I've heard some things in class, and I don't know that I believe in God the same way anymore. And I'm going to walk away from my, my faith. I'm just kind of done with God. By and large, I, I would tell you I don't believe that storyline anymore. I've kind of realized that the way it actually works is that 18-year-old goes away to college, he meets some young girl, he does things that he knows aren't right but didn't resist, and then, in an attempt to justify the whole thing in his head, comes up with a theological reason to reject God. So we act our way from God, not think our way away from God. See it all the way through Scripture. You see it here in chapter 2. They, they did things, and then they thought things. They did things that they knew were contrary to God's word, and then they recognized who God was and thought, we can't act this way and serve him, so we're going to act this way and going to find a new God, a different God, a, a, a God who will condone or even encourage what we're doing. Now, it's easy to pick on an 18-year-old, <laughs> right? It's easy to go, ah, oh, those 18-year-olds going away to university. It's not just 18-year-olds. You and I, we are doing the same thing. We sin and then we justify. And I don't mean to make you feel weighted down and burdened. I just want to caution you. Here's the caution. If you find yourself thinking things about God's word, going, I'm not sure I buy in. I'm not sure I believe that part. I'm going to challenge this idea. What I would beg you to do is check your heart first, not your head. Ask yourself the honest questions. Are there things, are there areas in my life that I just let slip? Where I'm now living contrary to God's word because chances are the actions came first, not the thoughts. That, that's the one thing I want you to see there in this chapter two that, that Israel fell into. The other thing that I think is worth just always being aware of is the fact that what one generation tolerates, the next generation participates in. And that's what's going on in this chapter. That's what Israel did. So one generation who had seen the mighty works of God, they they march into the promised land, they see God, and they live among the Canaanites, and they, they tolerate it. They aren't themselves participating. They're not, that generation, becoming like the Canaanites. It's their kids. They lived among it, they tolerated, and they, I'm, I imagine, this isn't in the text, but I imagine they maybe even had conversations where they said, you know, well, we're not going to, like, we'll live among them, but we're not going to do what they do. Obviously, we're not going to participate in that stuff, but, but they lived among them. And what one generation tolerates, the next generation participates in. And that was true then, and it's true now. You see, we have an obligation, we have a role in the next generation. Whatever age you are, you have a role in the next generation. And chances are, what I tolerate, the generation following me will participate. Let me give you a very simple example. Um, If we choose to watch, say, on television, shows where there's just foul language, and we say to ourselves, well, I can watch it, and I'm not going to actually start talking like that. I I can watch, but I'm not going to participate in it. Probably the next generation will lose that filter and they will no longer just tolerate, they'll participate. And we'll look upon that going, how did this happen? We didn't do that, but we we let it start to happen. Be really careful with what you tolerate. Not to become harsh and little and bitter people. We're supposed to be the most joy-filled people on the planet because we know Jesus. But we're also supposed to be pure and holy and right before the Lord. Be careful what you tolerate for the sake of the next generation because you have a duty. All through scripture, no one just gets to say it's just me and Jesus or it's even just me and my little family. When scripture speaks, it's always with the sense of one generation to the next. There is a sense of responsibility and duty. And what one generation tolerates, that next generation is going to be vulnerable to. Um, It's interesting. I was reading a study that just came across my desk this week. I'm not exactly sure how recent, fairly recent, and not even from a Christian perspective. The the study was noting a very unexpected trend, which is a decline in drug usage among our young people and a decline in in premarital sexual activity. Right? This is sociologists looking at this and going, wow, we did not expect to see this. Because everything in the media seems to tell us it's going the other way. But they actually have noted in the last 20 years a decline in those two things. And then they step back and go, how do we understand it? Why would this happen? Are we, I mean, not their words, are we getting better? Are we just getting more moral as a people? The answer is no. 
we're getting different. Here is their conclusion. We have now changed from bad socialization, meaning you go out to a party and someone says, here, try this. Now our young people aren't going. We've gone from bad socialization to no socialization. And as these activities have declined, the rates of youth depression, anxiety, and suicide have skyrocketed. And somewhere in that, we have a responsibility. What one generation tolerated, the next generation just got sucked into. So moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, those of you who yet to arrive at that point, live well for the next generation. It's on us. It's partly ours to bear. Okay, that's last week. Now we get to work this week. Beginning in chapter 2, verse 16, as I uh, often mention, if you don't have a Bible this morning, uh, go to the Info Center on your way out, get one so you can read God's Word throughout the week. I want to pick up reading here in verse 16. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to the judges. They whored after other gods, bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them, and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or stubborn ways. So the Lord, the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers, and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died." I'm going to stop there and just kind of consider a couple things before we move on. We're going to try to get up to the end of chapter 3, verse 6. Where we left off last week, the, the end of that section, we were looking at verse 15. We, we found the Israelites at a point in terrible distress. That's the final kind of words of verse 15. They had sinned against God. God had said, as a consequence of your sin, I'm no longer going to be, be with you to aid you. In fact, now I'm actually no longer just going to even just withdraw. I'm actually going to actively fight against you. And the, the war sort of situation as they go in, to try to gain more territory in their land, the promised land. God says, it's not even that I'm going to just stop sort of fighting with you. Now when you go to battle, I'm lining up on the other side. And we don't know all what that looks like. There's not much description. All we know is that the end result of it is we meet a people in terrible distress. And I think that's what you get when you line up against God. And the amazing thing to me, and I pointed this out last week, is that the book doesn't just end there. Judges ought to be a two-chapter long book where God just says, I told you what obedience looks like. I pledged myself to help you. I did what I said. You rebelled. Here's judgment. End of story. The most hopeful, amazing thing is that there's a verse 16. And that verse 16 isn't about ongoing judgment. Instead, we read that, that the Lord saved his people. Isn't that great? We're learning all through Judges who God is, who we are, how those things work. We meet a God who says, I'm going to save people. That's just fundamentally who I am. You want to know who God is? Part of his character is a God who saves. It's just who he is. It's remarkable that as we work through these next few verses and understand the nature of the sin, the, the way God sees it, that he saves despite that. Because by verse 17, we have sort of a, a depiction, a description of, of what that sin looked like. It wasn't just a matter that God says, here's how the sin felt. It was like I said, here's the law, and I'm like the police or like a judge, and you broke the law, and so now I'm angry because you broke a law. It's not a distant, sort of dispassionate sort of thing. The description we get here in these verses is actually, it's connected to like prostitution. It's, the idea is that God and his people were married, that there was like a husband-wife relationship. Elsewhere in scripture, it's described often as like a parent-father-son relationship. It's a close relationship where God loves us. It's not that we broke a law and disappointed him, it's we, we abandoned him. We turn from him. I've actually known once firsthand, but I've heard stories that kind of go like this that I think help us maybe, help me get a sense of the weight of this. 
of a young couple who set off all full of excitement and enthusiasm about life. And he goes off to medical school and she works two jobs. Happily, the sacrifice is worth it. She's going to put him, the love of her life, through school. And the years go on and she works hard and she does that and it seems so good and soon he's going to graduate and they're going to have a great life together and then graduation happens and he turns to her and he says, you know what? I'm not sure that we were ever meant to be together. I've met another girl in class and now that we're going to start life, I, I think I'd rather start it with that other woman. I don't know about you, but there's something about that kind of a scenario that go, oh, wow. That just makes me feel, I hope, a righteous anger. Oh, that kind of thing should never happen. But you see, that's closer to how God sees it. It's a betrayal, a fundamental, not, not just breaking rules, it's a betrayal of a relationship. He says, it's like Israel was married to me. And now has gone and prostituted herself to all these other gods. And yet, God has mercy. <laughs> Such does not boggle your mind. It does mine. How can he have mercy on a people who would do that? That's going to be pretty much the story of judges that we're going to walk into over and over and over again. And we're going to see God in all of his grace. Um, in these few verses, though, what I think is important for us to see this morning is the pattern or the plot line of the books. So like I said, Judges is really gracious to us. It's going to announce ahead how the book works so that then we can sort of follow along a little bit better. And we see it in these verses. We see a little five-point outline. This isn't me making it up. It's right there in the text. And here's how the plot goes. Israel sins. They're going to do it over and over again. Um... Chapter 3, 7, 3, 12, 4, 1, 6, 1, 10, 6, and 13, 1. So six moments where it's described Israel has done evil in the eyes of the Lord. Then, because of their sin, the Lord is provoked to anger. Because of that relationship he wanted with his people, his response to sin is anger, and then his response is in his anger to bring about judgment. That's the second step. We see it over and over all through these stories. The third step is that Israel calls out for deliverance, calls out for salvation. They groan to the Lord saying, would you save us? The fourth step is the Lord sends a judge, a man or a woman. There's actually 12 of them in the book, but six of them we call major judges because there's a big story about them and we see the full cycle. This cycle I'm described, we see it six times lined up with these six judges. The Lord saves his people through these judges and as long as the judge is alive, the salvation continues. The judge eventually dies because they're only human, and when they die, the people rebel against the Lord again. And then we start all over again. And the final rebellion is worse than the beginning one. You see that? It, it actually showed up already that the Lord was moved to pity, and then verse 19, whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt. It actually, it ends worse than it began. And we see this happen six times through the book. What's interesting about it is it's not, though, just a, a repeated pattern where we just see it six times over and over. It's more like a downward spiral. It gets worse and worse and worse the further we get. The judges get worse. The consequence gets worse. The people gets worse. The only part that remains constant and good is the grace of God. And actually, it shows up even in how the books sort of are written. So we get these six judges with these five cycles. Are we good at math? Anyone want to do six times five just to keep you awake? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> in the first judge uh, that we'll look at next week, all five elements show up. So we're going to see the perfect, this perfect plot. Sin, judgment, calling out salvation, and then sin again. The second judge, we see all five parts again. So we start going, oh, okay, we see how the book works. This is going to be very predictable. We'll just keep seeing these five things. But here's what's interesting. By the third judge, Deborah, we see four and a half. And it jars us by the time we get there because we're waiting for the five points and then we go, hold on a second. They're not all there. By the fourth judge, I would argue we're going to see about four and a quarter. And again, we're left going, something's actually going wrong. By, by the fifth judge, we're only going to see three. And by the last judge, Samson, two. And the point is, things are getting worse. These people, by the fifth judge, Samson, they don't even think to cry out to God. They're deeply, gravely troubled and oppressed, and they don't even cry out to the Lord. 
And yet, through all of it, God is gracious. It's just an incredible thing. In fact, it's a very unique word used to describe His grace. It shows up there in verse 18. The Lord was moved to pity by their groaning. There's this sense of a type of mercy, a type of compassion that the Lord has that's it's an amazing thing. It almost is difficult to really get the full sense of it in English. I've kind of looked and wrestled a little bit with the text, but it's just, it's such a unique other type of compassion that the Lord has that it almost seems like this is something that just is the territory of the Lord alone, the kind of pity he can have, the kind of mercy he can show. So we're going to walk through this cycle over these number of weeks and just see how the story is unfold. But uh, before we do that, let's just think a couple things through in this passage uh, for this morning. And then next week, as I promised, we'll get into our first judge. I made up a word this week. It's phenomenal. You're going to want to write this down. Because I was trying to think, well, what is the book of Judges? It's not just a history. If it was just a history, there should be other parts. It's a bad history if all it is is a history. In fact, it's, it's an out-of-order history, which makes it even worse. Because you know one writes history that's not historical in order, right? So there's all these strange things. It's not just a, a history. I don't know. I, I grew up, you know, with some English courses and those kind of things. And you learn that, you know, there's these Greek tragedies and comedies. Anyone ever get that? You, people try to... You know, define what is a Greek tragedy and what is a comedy. It's not just that one sort of like ha-ha funny. Some people say, well, it's minor characters and major characters and all these kind of things. Anyway, I invented a new word. I want to call judges a, a gracity. I really like that. I might write a book someday. I'm kidding. It's terrible, actually. But the point is that the book is all about the grace of God, the unique, unusual grace of God, and it permeates the whole thing. The flavor of the book is the grace of God in the face of profound human brokenness and sin. Particularly these elements. Number one, that grace shows up in the face of betrayal. That at the points where you would say there's just no way, there's no way grace should show up here, it shows up. That's the first thing. And what's amazing about that is God didn't force these people into any of this. This was their, this was their choice. He invited them into a covenant. You go back to Exodus 20 to 24, when the covenant is formed, God's relationship with his people. He says, here's, here's the gracious opportunity. I'm willing to have this kind of relationship with you. I'm not going to force you into this. And they willingly said, yes, we want this. And then a number of other occasions, they voluntarily reaffirm it and say, yes, we, we do want this. We're all in. And despite that, despite God not having forced anyone into this, they still betray him, and he still shows up with grace. And that boggles my mind. And I hope it encourages your heart. Because sometimes we've betrayed the Lord. And then we sit there and we say, is there, is there any hope? Like, how could the Lord forgive betrayers of him? And Judges says, it's who he is. He's been doing it right from the start. That is a beautiful, profound, important thing. Second thing that we learn about God's grace is it comes from compassion. I already mentioned that, that unique word. But more unique than that, maybe even is the fact that between verse 15 and 16, there is no cry to God. They're in terrible distress. There's no other verse that says, and in their distress they cried out to God in repentance and confession. They're just terrible distress, and the Lord saved them. That is a profound, unexpected thing. Don't we expect that people should have to cry out to the Lord? before he would save. And I'm going to argue, typically that is what we're going to see and certainly what we're instructed to do in Scripture. I'm never going to counsel you. It's like, no, just sit in your distress and sin and see if God will somehow do something. No, cry out to him and repent. But, but here in this moment, we see that even in the character of God is a compassion, even without that. Because he's just a God who has compassion. In fact, James tells us, that amazing statement that I still don't know quite how it all puts together, James 2.13, that mercy triumphs over judgment. And I know that to be the case because of Jesus. 
Yes, God is right to judge sin, and he does. But somehow in God's plan and purposes, he still sent his son, and his mercy and compassion is real. Third thing we see is that it's a grace that persists. It's not just a one-time event. It's a grace that just keeps showing up. In fact, when we look at verse 16, we see that the Lord's going to raise up judges, plural, not just once. He's like, I'll try this once, and if you don't get it, that's it. Not just three times, like three strikes and you're out. No, over and over, he raises up these men and women to save his people. In fact, look at verse 18, whenever the Lord raised up judges. In other words, he's just in the business of saving his people. And it doesn't end with the judges. He raises up kings. He raises up prophets. And then one day he sends his son. He's just in the business of having compassion over and over. And again, for, for, for me, I'll just speak for me, maybe some of you as well, it's just I'm so thankful. Because I have come up with all sorts of crazy ways to turn from him. Not just once, not just three times. <laughs> If it was a matter of you get one strike and you're out, I couldn't stand. But here he is, a God that has a grace that persists and he's just kept showing up and showing up. Last thing we learn, sadly about ourselves, not about God, that when God's grace shows up, so often it's abused. All right, in the book, we're going to learn about God and we're going to look, learn about us. And what we learn about God is that he does show up. He, his grace is connected to his compassion and it's a persisting thing. But what do we learn about us? What do we learn about humanity? Is when we see the grace of God, we abuse it. We don't treat it like the treasure for which it is. Instead, we say, huh, maybe there's a unique new way I can take the mercy and salvation of God and still do what my sinful heart wants to do. And you see it all through the story of Judges. A people that saw and tasted the sweet saving work of God who then just said, we choose sin yet again. We choose another God yet again. All right, so that's the pattern. That's what we're going to watch. Those cycles unfold over these next number of weeks, which leaves us just with a few more verses here for this morning that I think we need to actually wrestle with because there's one more great important truth tucked away here that I want you to see. Pick up in verse 21. I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left the nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of people of Israel might know war to teach war to those who had not known it before. And then we get a list of the nations and then we get sort of a last summary statement of how bad it gets before our first judge arrives on the scene. What's interesting about those couple verses is we encounter this strange, shocking new declaration. So let me remind you back in chapter 1 and 2 what God had done. Because Israel had rebelled and sinned, he had said, I'm no longer going to drive out the nations. Instead, I'm going to let them have victory over you. That's the consequence. That's the judgment. And then in chapter 2 in the tail end, in the beginning of chapter 3, God says, oh, I'm going to use that same thing now for two other purposes. Meaning, I'm going to use your sin and the consequence of your sin for a redemptive good purpose. I hope that excites you. Because if God can't do that, we are in deep trouble. Romans 8 tells us he does. Romans 8 tells us that he can work in all things. For good for his people who, who love him, who are called for, to, to conform us, to make us more like Christ. Nothing goes to waste. And here we have one of these rare, strange moments that I hope we wrestle with, because I think we ought to, where we had a people who sinned, who are judged by God, and then God uses the judgment itself for two new redemptive purposes. What are they? One, in order to test them. That's the first one, verse 21, 22. And then secondly, in order to to train them for war. Let's just deal with that one first because we're going to try to work through this testing one for a few minutes. What's this training for war issue? Um, Make sure you read Deuteronomy 20 if you haven't yet. 
Because my vision of what that looks like is different than what Scripture's picture is. When I think of God training his people for war, I'm picturing a people who don't know how to wield a sword, and so God might, it's like, well, I'll leave some enemies there so you can learn how to march in formation and, you know, carry a shield or sword. I don't know. I've seen a few movies. I'm not quite sure how it looked. Right? But that's kind of the picture in my head. It's the wrong picture. Read Deuteronomy 20. Google what was Israel's, you know, instruction for battle in the Old Testament. What God is doing when he says, there's a generation that hasn't seen and understood and experienced war. He's really, in essence, saying there's a generation that hasn't seen that they need to totally depend on me. Because Israel had some of the strangest instructions when it comes to battle. I mean, I'm no military guy, but even I can understand that what God instructed them to do was a terrible military plan. You take your young guys who are at the height of their strength, who are marrying age, and then you tell them, oh, if you've been married, go home. Like, if you're newly married, you don't need to fight. And you take your young men who would be building farms in a nation that's just sort of getting going, and you say to them, oh, if you planted a crop, go home. You don't need to fight. And then you say to all the cowards like me, if you're a little bit afraid, go home. And then God says, we're going to go to war with what's left. <laughs> I don't think there's many people left. And then we start to see the tactics. You know, when you surround a city, don't surround it completely. You know, that's what they did. Again, I've read enough books, I've seen enough movies, I know how a siege works. You surround it and you starve them out. That's just how it works. It's not what Israel did. They'd surround it partially and leave a gap so that people could leave. (laughs) That's never going to work. And then they were instructed, you, you can't cut down all the trees, you can't stop the water source. How do you win a war with no standing army, no, no training, where you send a whole bunch of people home, and then you take all the normal tactics off the table, and then you say, okay, Israel, now go and fight. You only win if God fights for you. And I think we ought to read that little, those couple phrases when God says, I want to train them for war. We, we'd be better off reading it. I want them to learn to depend on me. We're going to march into battle completely outgunned. That if I didn't show up, there'd be no victory. And I need the next generation to learn that lesson. Because Joshua and his generation got it. So God says, so I'm going to leave some enemies there so you could just see that I can come through for my people. But he also says, I left them there to test them. Now, I have a very broken, bent view of testing, I think. Uh, It's largely informed by grade 9 math, where I am pretty much convinced that my teacher just was trying to ruin my life. I I can't actually, I can't remember his name. So, (laughs) you always got to be careful. I wouldn't use his name, because this will go on the internet if someone ever said, hey, did you see Um, but I remember, for some reason, and I was reasonably okay at math, but for some reason, in grade 9 math, it's like every time a test came, something happened inside of me where everything I knew disappeared. I don't know if any of you have experienced this. And I would sit there, and I just remember just being devastated, feeling like, I think he's trying to just destroy me. The teacher, that is. And ever since then, whenever I read in Scripture or encounter this idea of testing, I've got to be honest, that's kind of what I think. I, to me, a test feels like something where you're trying to cause someone to fail. You're trying to like wreck their lives. And so I read this idea that, that God left enemies there to test them, and my slant is, that's a bad thing. And then I stop and I step back and go, hold on a second, objectively, and there's no teacher in their right mind that has that plan. It's not how teachers... In fact, if all your students fail the exam, probably you as a teacher go, actually reflects badly on me. The point of a test isn't to crush people. The point of a test is to help them prepare and then show them that they've done well and they've passed and they've mastered the content. God doesn't leave this enemy in the land so that Israel can be destroyed and put to shame. He leaves them there so that they can show that they've trusted the Lord and they can at the end of the day step back and say, look, we trusted the Lord, we obeyed him, and look at how well things have gone because of that. God says, I've done that. This is a purpose and it's a gracious purpose. This is not a bad purpose. So all through life we have trials and things that come along. And Scripture doesn't back down from calling them tests. 
Scripture doesn't spend a lot of time saying, let's think about why these things happened before. It doesn't analyze how did we get into the trouble or the problem. It spends a whole lot of time saying, why and what is the purpose on the other side? We tend to think of the why question before. Now, let's analyze this thing and figure out how we got here. Scripture says, don't spend too much of your energy there because you'd be way better off spending your energy on the other side of this equation saying, what is the purpose? How can we grow through this? What is God doing in our lives? And I think there's some things that we need to consider. Five of them, in fact. I, I wrote myself a little list so I wouldn't forget them here. Um, oh, I was going to just give you one, a couple examples. Um, one is Abraham. Remember when Abraham, he's told to take his son, his only son, Isaac? Trust me, I've grappled with that one. I've got a son, and his name is Isaac. And um, Abraham's told to kill him, offer him as a sacrifice. And he binds him, and he's prepared to do it. God stops it. Later on in chapter 22, I think it's verse 18, God says to Abraham, Now, through you and your offspring, I'm going to bless the world because you obeyed me. And I've wondered about my own life. It's like, have I missed moments where God says, I've, I've asked something of you. And I wanted you just to declare your obedience. Your unreserved obedience in the face of something that doesn't even make sense. Because what was asked of Abraham doesn't make sense. And God just said, just, I'm asking you to obey me and trust me. And on the other side of that obedience, I have something amazing planned. And some of you are probably sitting here today and God's asking you to obey him in something. You're going, it doesn't make sense. Why would I do that? And maybe it's just because God's saying on the other side of that obedience, I'm planning to use you. Obey him. Trust him. Or think of Israel in the, in the wilderness. They come to the borders of the promised land the first time and they send out spies. Send 12. 10 come back with an accurate report. Let's not pretend it's not accurate. The report is, they're huge, we're not. That's the reality. In fact, their, their description is we're like grasshoppers, which for years it took me a while to get that figured out until I saw like a grasshopper swarm. I think what they're saying is there's lots of us, because there were millions of Israelites. They're looking out. We're like grasshoppers. We're small, but when you hit them with a windshield, have you ever hit a grasshopper with your windshield? It doesn't put up much resistance. There's our assessment. We're outnumbered and we stand no chance. And God says, I, I wanted you to see that. I'm going to march you right in to see how impossible this is. And then I'm going to say, obey me still and trust me. And I think sometimes God lets us see how impossible things are. He doesn't hide it from Israel. He doesn't wait until they march onto a battle line before he finally reveals how difficult this is going to be. He, he lets them know it in advance so they have a chance to trust him. And maybe God will let you know in advance how insurmountable the odds are because he just wants you to have a chance to trust him. He's glorified in that. Let's just still think of these five purposes from Scripture of testing really quick. The first one is this. It's to let you demonstrate that you're growing in faith. It's to let you pass the test, not to crush you and destroy you. James 1, 2 talks about counting it all joy whenever you face trials of various kinds. Why? Because the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. God expects us to pass. It's not the testing of your faith produces destroyed, crushed people. God says, I'm going to be with you. I put my spirit within you so you can pass the test and then look back and say, huh, I did it. With the Lord's help, I did it. And something inside grows. Second thing, it's to lead us. God leads us through trials. Don't ever lose sight of that. He directs our steps. Some of the most significant ways that God has directed me have been through hard things. And I, they come and say, I don't like this, I don't want this. And yet on the other side, sometimes it's years later looking back, you go, isn't it interesting that God got me to where he got me and it was through the trial. And had that trial not happened, I would not have moved. It's a story of an old guy who was on a boat a uh, ship that was out at sea in a storm and a woman fell overboard and... Um, she was drowning, and no one jumped in to save her. I mean, it was night and stormy, and no one wanted to risk their life. And finally, one guy jumps in, and he saves her, and they threw a rope. And later, they wanted to honor him. Everyone's like, let's throw a party for this guy. And they were a little bit embarrassed because the guy who saved her was the oldest man on the ship. And all these young, strapping guys looked. It's like, wow, we didn't jump in. 
And so he comes up as they're honoring him and he asks if he could share a few words and he starts his speech this way. He says, I just, I just want to ask you one question. I mean, hearts of everyone just sink. They know. They, what's he going to ask us? Why we were so coward, cowards? He says, I just want to know who pushed me. <laughs> Sometimes trials are just the push. We, just, we, we were going to stand still. We didn't have the courage to act. And God says, I'm going to help you act. You need to act. Proverbs 20, verse 30 tells us that. That God uses trials that way. Third thing, sometimes it's discipline. Sometimes we are off track and God as a loving father needs to discipline us and teach us his ways. That's what David says in Psalm 119, 71. He says, it's good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes. He says, good. I would not have learned this otherwise. It would not have been a part where the knowledge got from my head. He knew them, but then he said, the affliction helped me learn them. It moved to my heart. Something happens during those times of trial. The fourth thing, to possibly protect you from greater harm. We can never know this, because probably God's not going to share it, but I've, I've come to appreciate my wife's faith in this, who has said so many times over the course of her years, Don, we don't know what the Lord spared us from because of what you viewed as a trial or a hardship. I mean, just take the most simple example. We're on the, the freeway. This has happened multiple times, and we're stuck in traffic. And all I can think about is the frustration that this is stopping me from getting to whatever it is I think. And, and then my wife will say, but you don't know. Like Maybe the Lord spared us from something. Like, ah, I hate that, and I love that. <laughs> Because I know it's true. Joseph said in chapter 50 of Genesis, verse 20, he said, you intended it for evil, but the Lord intended it for good. Now we understand that that means that God is good and he's sovereign, and so what, what, what Joseph's helping us understand is that God can work even when we're in the middle of suffering and all those kind of things woven in there, that God is still in control. But there's another part to that. Where it seems like what Joseph's helping us understand is that all through the course of his life, some of what was going on was there to move him and get him to a place where God was going to do something better. Sometimes our trials might be God protecting us. Lastly, it's to give us a chance to grow. Romans 5, 3 to 4. Look it up sometime. Be encouraged by that. Because we grow through hard things. We'll bring this in for a landing. Here's, here's the reality of this in my life. It's really easy to look at Israel and go, you foolish, foolish people. I can see the cycle. I can see the five steps. How can you not do something different next time? Why do you keep doing the same thing? It's always easy to point it out in other people, isn't it? It's probably easy for you to look at me and go, wow, why can't you see Right? Because we can see that in others and we're blind to it ourselves. But here's the reality. We all get stuck in cycles. Passionately committed to the Lord where we just, we meet with Him and go, I don't care what comes, I'm all in. I'm going to wake up and this week I'm going to do my devotions every morning and I'm... And then by Thursday, it's done. And we repeat the cycle over and over. Over and over. How do we break it? What do we do with that? There's two things that I see in this passage. The first one is that verse 17 tells us they didn't listen. They were saved, Israel, but they didn't ever listen. Make sure you listen to the Lord. He speaks through his word. He put his spirit within us so that we would listen. Don't ever stop listening. The second thing, in verse 19, they did not drop their practices are stubborn ways. They never did. Through all of it, they never dropped it. We have a, a New Testament word for that. It's called repentance. It's saying, the way I've chosen to live, wow, this is broken. I'm just going to, I give up. I'm not doing that. I'm going to drop it. We need to live in a perpetual state, I think, almost of repentance. We just constantly know I'm going to continue to have to lay down stuff and trust the Lord. Because we otherwise will end up in the same crazy broken cycle.
Those two pages are done quick. There we go. Um, I just want to end with Jesus. See, ultimately what we need is perfect obedience. Did you get that through the story? We're going to see it. Had Israel been able to perfectly obey, the story would have ended so different. And they just never could. And the same thing is seemingly required of people. A holy God requires a holy people. You start to see the dilemma? We are not it. We're not a perfectly obedient people. So what, what do we do with that? It's interesting, all through the description of Jesus, you get some really strange things. Strange things pointed out that he's, as a baby, is taken to Egypt, essentially as a refugee, so that God says, so that I can say, out of Egypt I called my son. That's odd. Then, after his baptism, he's led into the wilderness where he's tempted. That's odd to point that out. That one of the temptations would be that you can have the kingdom. You can have all the kingdoms and it's easy. That's an odd thing to point out. All through those things, what's being pointed out to us is that Jesus is the perfect Israel, so to speak. In fact, even the title, Son of God, is the same title used in the Old Testament for Israel. Israel is my son. And Jesus now is the perfect, obedient son of God, called out of Egypt, brought through the wilderness, perfectly obeys where Israel fails. Isn't that interesting? So that by the time he gets to the cross, he could be the only one for whom he deserved no wages of death. Because Roman tells us the wages of sin is death. That's what we earn through our sin. But Jesus didn't deserve it. He had perfectly obeyed and then still died. So that through faith and trust in that sacrifice, we could be made right with God, that it wouldn't depend on our obedience. In fact, Romans 10 tells us that if we confess with our mouths and believe in our, believe in our heart that Jesus has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Not we might be, we hope to be, we will be. And how can we say it with confidence? We couldn't if it depended on our obedience. If it depended on us being obedient when we walked through those doors, our salvation, we'd never be able to say to anyone, you will be saved. The best would be a faint hope, and let's be honest, a very faint hope. But Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God, perfect, obedient Son of God who gave himself for us. And I hope and trust you've come to know him so that as much as we long to learn through trials and do well through trials at the end of the day, our salvation rests in him.